So let me start with gas. Gas is still such a big story of the energy space worldwide. Um, use of it is rising in China and in the power sector. How much more can the gas sector actually grow? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, one of the messages from, from this year's statistical review of world energy is that 2017 was a bumper year for natural gas. Strong growth, the strongest growth we've seen uh, for seven or eight years. On the demand side, much of that growth was led, was led, was led by China. Gas consumption in China grew by over 15 percent um, last year. And the big driver of that was environmental policies encouraging a switch away from coal into cleaner fuels, particularly natural gas in the, in the in industrial and residential sector. And that, and that sort of push in China accounted for around a third of the global expansion in natural gas last year. Um, Spencer, renewables are clearly rising quickly, but um, I think we understand that there may be need a, a, price, a, a price on carbon. Why? Does BP actually advocate for a straight carbon tax? We need to make more progress in terms of reducing carbon emissions if we're going to get on a, way to, on, on a road consistent with meeting those Paris climate goals. We sort of know from basic economics, from hundreds of years of economics, if you don't like something, the most efficient way of trying to ration it is you put a price on it. We have seen around the world um, the effectiveness of putting a price on carbon, and, and, I, and BP is a strong view that as part of that transition to a lower carbon energy system, we need to, the most, one of the most efficient ways of doing that is putting a meaningful price on carbon. A, minor, a meaningful price on carbon provides the right incentives for everybody to try to economize on carbon, and, and BP will continue to push for, for that type of policy. But Spencer, how worried should we be that carbon emissions rose after three years where they flatlined, and so did coal use? I think it's a sort of a. I think you should see it in the context of sort of two steps forward, one step back. We've three, seen three exceptional years of almost little or no growth in carbon emissions. Some of that sort of exceptional performance was driven by long term structural factors, which are still there and they're still persisting. But some of it was driven by sort of short run cyclical factors, which we knew wouldn't carry, wouldn't persist in the long run. Some of those unwound last year. And so, not surprisingly, we saw some sort of a partial step back from that exceptional performance. Seen in the round, the last four years still provide an encouraging story relative to the past uh, 10 or 15 years, but it's only a partial step towards what we need to see if we're going to get on that road to Paris. Um, the U.S. is clearly becoming a bigger energy exporter. When does it become a net exporter, and what does that mean for foreign policy or geopolitics? So the the global um, so the the American energy system has changed very dramatically um, over the last five, ten, fifteen um, years. Um, it's still a net importer of energy today, but on current trends, within the next three or four years, the amount of energy it produces could be broadly consistent with the amount it consumes. It will still trade substantially in terms of different different fuels, but in terms of net self sufficiency within um, within the next five years or. So you could see that. And the, the, the change in, in oil is, is very dramatic. If you go back 10 years or so, um, the US was importing about 12 million barrels a day of oil. Last year, it only imported around four, just over four million barrels a day of oil. So really substantial changes in the nature of the, of the American energy system. And that has huge implications for the economy if it doesn't need to import as, many, as much energy as it used to. Um, for the exchange rate, if you don't need to import there, it affects the nature of the, the current, capital, current account deficit. But also, as you say, geopolitical aspects, if it no longer needs to be importing so much oil from, from some of those key um, Middle East economies as well. Yeah, and, and Spencer, what are you expecting from OPEC and Russia at their meeting next week? It seems that they're intent on reviving production. Is that what the world needs right now? So one of the messages from 2017 was those sort of OPEC plus um, those other countries like led by Russia, those production cuts have worked. Um, they, 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 they exceeded their targeted production cuts 
And as a result, um, stock levels have come back down to more normal levels, exactly as um, and they hoped. I think going in um, to next uh, week's uh, OPEC decision, I think there will be two questions, um, I think, on people's minds. One, um, how long, what will they say about how those production cuts? At the moment, they're, they're expected to uh, go through to the end of the year. Will they say anything about the pace of, of, of exit beyond that? And the other question, I think, is at the moment, the current level of cuts are quite significantly greater than the targeted number. Will they say anything about trying to sort of get back to their sort of targeted levels of production cuts rather than the overshoot we've seen at the moment?